Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. It's April the 7th, day 97, and we've got a brand new book today. Um, it'll be the only time we talk about this. Um, and oh, really? This is it. Yeah, because oh. you read it all in one day. You read yeah. all four chapters in one day. And uh, so um, we're in Ruth 1. Ruth is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. I love the story of Ruth. Um, before we came on the air, I was telling them the very first sermon I ever preached was uh, from this passage, actually. And, uh, and it was also eight minutes long. <laughs> um, and I just like, I was reading everything, you know. I, know, I was scared to death is what I was. That's, that, that's the truth. Um, but I'm going to read a couple of verses and we're going to have uh, some conversation about uh, this. There's, I, I could talk about the book of Ruth for hours because there's just so much in it. But it says, In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. When they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other named uh, uh, other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, Malon and Kilion died. So there's a famine. Um, I heard uh, I heard a sermon one time on just the first part of that first verse that says in the days the judges ruled and he preached an entire sermon on the challenges of judges ruling. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want to talk mm -hmm. about today. But it says a severe famine came on the land and they chose to leave. Famines press in on us. They mm -hmm. cause us to make choices in our life. Um, what choices are we faced with in famine? What, what can we be faced with with, with famine? And it's, I'm not just talking about, we, we probably know the word drought better today, uh, but when there's a lack of anything, what will it cause us to choose? What choices are there? I think it puts your priorities in place. Okay. Because you have to decide what's most important. Because you're, you know, typically in, in a situation where you feel like there's famine, you're gonna be doing without something. Yeah, you go into survival mode, and as we're told in the beginning of this story, you know, here's a, a man and his family, and and I'm convinced that during seasons of black, whatever it looks like, that you make decisions oftentimes based on those you have closest to you, even more so than you would for your own self, and that you'll go places and you'll do things, you'll take risk, um, and make decisions that you otherwise would not have made and sometimes it turns out to be a really good thing. You, you see where famine or lack of something in your life motivated you to make some decisions that turned out really good for you on the backside. And it can motivate you to make decisions sometimes that aren't in your best interest. And, and that's the precarious place to be in. Yeah, and so the, the symbolism, so there's lots of symbolism in Ruth, is they choose to go to Moab. Moab has this symbolism of being a bad place, a sinful place. It is, is a representative of sin mm -hmm. almost in scripture. Moab comes from the two girls who get their father drunk, have sex with him, and that's, that's, how, the, the, that, that's how that country or that group of people get started. Um, you talked about self-preservation, both of you did. You know, you're trying to do what's best, but this doesn't seem to be a good decision to me. Like if you're choosing, it, on the surface you go, he was trying to protect his family. But why would he take his family to Moab? Why would he take his place, his family to a place that um, has never been a friend to these people? It's because apparently they had something to offer and he was willing to take a chance on being in a place they otherwise wouldn't be. Mm -hmm with people who had been their enemies uh, in the past and would continue to be uh, conflicts between, but he was pursuing what he thought was the most critical immediate need, which was some food to, to put in their bellies. Uh, and sometimes that 
turns out good, sometimes it doesn't. But it also cautions us that if we make decisions, long-term decisions based on short-term circumstances, that oftentimes it will lead us in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. Cheryl? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think when you get in desperate situations, you often make decisions that you normally wouldn't make. Or unfortunate. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in this say, case, they needed food. Mm -hmm. They were hungry. We're going to find later they need redemption, you know, to get out of a situation that they're in. But I see people all the time who, let's say they don't, find affection or encouragement in their marriage who seek it elsewhere because they're not getting that need met and it becomes a devastating choice right. but they're doing it because at that moment there's an extreme lack, lack of something and and they're like you know well, if you're not going to give it to me somebody else is going right. to give it to me you know it is it is how such it's, it's you know it, you see it with kids who end up in in gangs mm -hmm. you know or in in groups of bad behavior, there there's something absent from their yeah. life, and so they seek to yeah. fulfill it somewhere. Yeah, else. they're they're trying to fulfill a legitimate need. Right, it is a legitimate need, but they do it in an illegitimate in an illegitimate way, way. And, and it causes them problems. The, I don't know. This is a question I've never pondered, but it's just one that is intriguing me right now. How different would could things have been had they stayed? I mean, this family suffers. A lot of loss. I mean, they leave with four Jewish people and come back with one and a Moabite. That's 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 uh, the three patriarchs of the family are gone. If they had stayed, I, I, and all we're doing here is we we have no revelation about this. So we're right. really speculating. You're right. How different could things have been? Worst case scenario, they could have starved. Yeah. Then we. Then they die people. anyway. Right. Yeah, Pretty quickly. I don't know how much later. Well, yeah. the boys died ten years later after the father, but it's not doesn't right. seem there. I mean, she's young enough. Naomi's young enough. She can walk back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that's kind of the that's that's the way I see it. Um, so anyway, she she hears there's bread back in Judah where she was from. Let's go back, and she starts back and both of her daughters-in-law start with her. She encourages them to stay, you know, but they decide, okay, here we want to, we want to go. But one of them is not fully committed. We haven't been that long talked about the, mm -hmm. what the struggles of lack of commitment. We have another situation here. What should our response be to people that aren't fully committed? How should we respond to them when they say, no, I really, I, I can't do it. I really didn't want to go to go to begin with. I didn't like teaching this class. You know. Well, at that point, I mean, really, you, you don't have a lot of options. Uh, you can release them with your blessings, or you can release them without your blessings. I think that's the two ultimate choices. Mm -hmm. You know, we we can, uh, and it's difficult, even in church work. You know, as a leader. When, when you determine that somebody's not committed to something that they had previously indicated they weren't committed to, uh, it can rub you the wrong way. You can want to release them, you know. <laughs> faster? Yeah, you know, a little faster. With, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be spiritual here. <laughs> uh, or, or you can release them with your blessings, uh, which may mean they actually go somewhere else completely. Right. Um, best case scenario, they, they step out of that role and you help find a place for them to be truly committed in because maybe it's a better fit. But oftentimes that means that they move on completely away from you, from the church. Um, and you know to try to maintain relationships in spite of that can be a challenge, but I think ultimately it should be our goal. Any thoughts? Well, on the practical side of things, I think if you've been in a position where you've had somebody who's doing something who isn't committed to it, then you know how that's going to turn out eventually. Yeah, but those separations are painful. Yes, they can be. I, I mean, you know, sometimes it's a relief, mm -hmm. but it's still painful. Yeah, and they can be awkward on the backside. Yeah, uh, when you do see those people again, uh, and I find it's usually more awkward for them than it is for me. Right. Uh, you know, because I think everybody makes 
makes assumptions about how the other person feels or what their perception is toward each other, yeah. and then it, it, it gets convoluted. So um, there's a famous piece to this um, chapter that l lots of people have heard but don't know where it comes from. So Ruth decides she's staying, Orpah turns back, and she says um, to her, Ruth, Ruth uh, Naomi's trying to get her to go to, and she says, um, your people, it says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. That's her response. you know. And the funny thing is, we take that little piece, because she goes on to say, um, may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Mm. We don't tell we don't that talk line. about that. So that's no, right. So that gets read in weddings. Mm -hmm. I mean, there. I, I would guess fifty to seventy-five percent of all weddings read that. Wherever you go, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Um, read that. There's a couple of questions I would I want to ask because one of them I have in my notes. The other one I only just thought to ask. The, the first question I have is can we apply this where you go passage to all relationships? We read it at marriage, but it's a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. I mean, shouldn't we be bringing the mother-in-law up and letting the daughter-in-law say this to her mother-in-law, not her husband? <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, that's what you're doing when you're marrying your son or daughter anyway. <laughs> yes, to a large degree. Yeah. That is true. I mean, their family is going to become your family. It, do, I guess it, the, the question I would ask is, do you think this is a fair passage to translate into a marriage battle? Only if we emphasize the latter part of it, may the Lord punish us severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Have you ever heard that read at a wedding? Well, we, we typically say it like this, till death do us part. Mm -hmm. But... Yes. But I think, and I may start putting this in right here, where they have them repeat this, where the Lord punished me severely. <laughs> you can't think, but death separates us because, you know. Yeah, but that's in the vow portion. I'm talking about yeah. when we read this verse, we rarely say, may the Lord severely. We, we rarely that's what I'm saying. That, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think we should add that, that to it, be a requirement for it, because, you know, the, the first part, oh, that sounds so nice, you yeah. know, and I'll go where with you, you and I won't abandon you. But, and by the way, if I break my promise and commitment to covenant, there's consequences. Yeah, consequences. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we should put emphasis on that, uh, whether it's an actual ceremony, pre-marriage counseling, but also to some degree, you know, when we make a commitment to God to serve Him, to give ourselves to Him, when we make it to the local church to serve in whatever capacity that looks like, we do need to have more of an awareness that it's a significant thing when we make a commitment. Oh. But, but sure, aren't there some consequences to a lack of commitment? Whether it's in marriage or your job or of to course. be a parent. Um, I, I just think sometimes we don't realize that, that there are consequences. You, you, When you're not committed to being a parent, when you're not committed being a husband or a wife, and you're not committed to your job that you're there for, there are some severe consequences. You don't, you you do get severely punished Absolutely. when you don't follow through. Yeah. You know, you may not like it. And it often affects other people too. That's right. So she shows back up in, t in Bethlehem, and the whole town's excited about her arrival. Apparently, they were popular people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it says, Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. And she says, Don't call me Naomi. She responded, instead call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy on me? So she she calls herself something different mm -hmm. because she's broken. She's empty. How does grief change our personality and how we view ourselves? Sir, you want to lead out? Uh, I mean, I think you're explanation of her feeling broken is probably right because she has lost her husband she's lost her two sons now one of her daughter-in-law mm -hmm. has stayed behind they're moving from the place they have become their home at least temporarily and she doesn't know what she's coming back to because they have no way to provide for themselves right i'm sure she feels like it can't get much worse than this you know to your question grief changes i think every aspect of our life um, the closer we are to the time and the source of grief i think the more impact it has 
and without some coping skills um, to deal with that, it can cause us, as she said here in, in the word, um, I think the best translation probably is bitter, can make us bitter and we can live the rest of our lives bitter if, if we don't ever come to grips with what has happened to us and learn to process that. Not that it's gonna change the circumstance, but it can change us, who we are, and how we look moving forward in, in our life. Yeah, I think it, it changes our outlook. It changes how we view the past. You know, this was a stupid decision. You, you know, should it, never have left here to begin with, you know. Yeah, because, in the future. Right. Oh, absolutely. You know, looking back, you know, on the front end, it, it obviously seemed like a good decision. Hey, they've got some stuff over there. We can eat and live better. We're just going to stay there a little while. It turned out to be several years. Then they come back, and, and to your question that was posed earlier, what would it have looked like if they had stayed? I think this is the closest insight we have. Apparently, the town they left from and the people were still there. They survived through that process. Uh, and so otherwise, they wouldn't have been excited and grieving when they came back. So apparently, most of the people survived uh, that season, even though they chose to leave. Yeah, so I'm trying to make sure uh, this this goes on this isn't in Ruth one but it's just kind of what happens and I want to this is how I want to close it says so Naomi returned from Moab that's how the chapter ends and accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth the young Moabite woman they arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest and it, it, it says the very next chapter says Ruth got up and went to work um, sometimes bringing back a sense of normalcy is the most healthy thing that you can do. This is what I got to do. I can sit here and moan and groan and, you know, weep. But sometimes just getting up and, and going to work yeah, is getting, the answer. Re-engaging. That's right. In some sense of normalcy. Outside, I mean, they're grieving death. I don't know how long it had been since Ruth's husband had died. It's a little more close than, than Naomi's husband. Uh, but she clearly has affected her 10 years later, you know, that she's lost everything. What are some, we, we are in moments of, we've been through two years of grief. Mm. You know, there are a lot of things lost that are never coming back, mm -hmm. you know, not just death. I mean, it's just things that are, that, that just changed and, and they're never coming back. Your suggestion, maybe your input, your encouragement to people who, they've walked through this, things look completely different than they did before. What are some ways that they can Re use the word re-engage, get started back, make another step in the right direction. What are some ways they could do that? It seems to me that she was focusing in on what had to be done. We need to eat. Instead of what could have been done. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to focus on this one thing that I can do right now, which was to provide for she and her mother-in-law because they had to eat. And apparently there was nobody else that was going to provide it for them. And I think that when you're in a state of grief, that that probably can help propel you forward more than anything else can. If, for instance, you're grieving, you know, somebody in your family that's passed away, but you have children or you have a spouse, there's things that have to be done daily, and they're often going to be left up to you, or they're not, they're, they won't happen. Yeah. And I think if we can focus on those things that we know need to be done, it gives us a sense of purpose and something to move forward with. Yeah. Even if it's just in the beginning, that that's kind of what, you know, propels you. Yeah, you may have to initially start with what has to be done, mm -hmm. and then you can move on to things that you want to do. You know, this this was in late spring. Um, you know, as, as this is being aired, we are into spring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important, you, and you mentioned the, the, the pandemic uh, and grief, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that term, you know, the past two years. Life hasn't looked normal for any of us. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of death. Lots. Mm -hmm. Not physical death, just physical That's death. right. But as we approach spring, uh, this time of year, I would encourage people, get outside. 
look at the the literally at the flowers that begin to bloom the, the rebirth the rebirth and, and the renewal and celebrate life get out in the fresh air get in the garden uh pull some weeds out you know <laughs> get some physical exercise start having some barbecues with people you know but re-engage reignite get back into some sense of, of normalcy uh to the degree that that you have lost or has been delayed put on hold and and be intentional uh, about reconnecting with people and relationships and um, embrace life and, and just go for it. And because um, I think after two years, what happens is there's this repression and depression and, and, and kind of the mentality that she had, you know, now this is my new life and I'm just, you know, it's never going to be the same. Well, part of that is true, but we can change a lot of that and things that you can be intentional about it and um, and go for it. Yeah, I was uh, recently at this one of the elementary schools uh, for lunch uh, a few weeks back, and uh, it was a beautiful day outside. It's probably seventy degrees, um, and they had it was a special. They were celebrating Dr. Seuss's birthday, mm -hmm. so they had the icy trucks there, and all the kids got to go out and get ices, and they were playing in the in the gr grass and. Every, almost every teacher that I engaged with that day said, this is so wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're back, looks, they're back outside, they're yep. playing, they're, they're enjoying life, they're, they're being together, this is, this, is, this is what we need. And I do think that sometimes um, trying to find something that moves us in that direction of this resembles life mm -hmm. instead of this resembles death. If we're not careful, will sit around and death will consume us. That'll become our new identity. That's right, instead of life consuming us. Yep. And I think that's important. So. Well, good. Jay, you want to close us in prayer today? Lord, we uh, thank you that even though we make decisions sometimes uh, in our seasons of lack that may or may not turn out so good for us that you ultimately use everything to your good. And we're grateful for that as we've seen in this story. And Lord, as we have talked about uh, trying to change our focus and perspective, May we not be guilty of living in the past and our defeats and our failures and things that we have been lacking, but may we embrace uh, the newness of life. And may we embrace the opportunities that you place before us and may we begin to live again, not only in and through you spiritually, but in a practical sense. And, and may we look to the good that's all around us and embrace that and live life to the fullest for your glory and honor, we pray in Jesus' name.